So before we get started, uh, gonna these are the things that I'm gonna be uh, covering today. So um, this this really is a session about uh, you know be, being able to get started with Cassandra the right way. So um, a couple of months ago, uh, Nate asked me to to do a talk here at the Pachycon, um, and essentially it's. I'm trying to target the, the the top questions that a lot of uh, users uh, ask in the in the various um, channels, whether it's on ASF Slack or um, on the mailing list. Um, uh, and I wanted to go through some of the stuff that um, you know things that you wish you knew when you first started with Cassandra. So um, I, I'm get, I'm looking at the people who have joined the session and. Um, a lot of you are quite experienced, so that this session is probably not for you. It was really intended for those who are new to Cassandra, probably, you know, people who are uh, users who have uh, two years or less experience with Cassandra. Um, but anyway, here we go. So I'm going to start off and um, just give you give the new users an idea of how you can quickly um, fire up a uh, Cassandra cluster and the 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 you know the top three things that you need to configure just to get started really quickly. I'll talk about um, things like how to plan your deployment and some of the recommended settings. I'm not gonna cover everything. So again, this was intended for uh, new users. Um, and uh, a lot of the things that I get asked a lot is, you know, what kind of um, tools are available out there to use with Cassandra. So I'll talk about that um, a little bit too. Um, and I'll cover some of the troubleshooting. Um, and then finally, um, I'll, I'll go through some of the resources that's available out there. So for new users who are, you know, that they, they're starting out with Cassandra, I'm going to give you some uh, re resources where you can get uh, learn stuff for free. Um, some resources for um, when you're first, first time building applications on Cassandra and you know where to go to next, next and maybe ask questions. Um, so to get us off, so just a, a little bit about me. I'm a developer advocate at Datastax. I've been a Cassandra enthusiast for um, j just over seven years. Um, and as you would have worked out by now, I'm based in Australia. So I co-host uh, the Melbourne and Sydney meetup groups. Um, kind of got started um, a few years ago with that, and and really why I'm here is because I help a lot of um, users in various channels. I've mentioned already the ASF Slack. There's also the Cassandra mailing list, um, Stack Overflow. Um, when I've got a bit of um, spare time, um, having said that, I do most of this stuff um, in my spare time on weekends, um, night time. A lot of times, um, early in the morning, being on the other side of the planet. <laughs> Thanks, Cedric. Not all of them. Um, and we also have uh, the the YouTube channel, Data Stacks Devs, um, where um, I, you know, um, there's a bunch of us at uh, Data Stacks that run workshops on a weekly basis. We, we have two or three workshops on the go all the time. And finally, the community.datastacks.com site. So that's those are the places where you'll find me um, pretty much most of the time. Um, it, this is stuff that I do in my spare time and weekends, um, pretty much all my waking hours. And so after all that, um, we're going to get started. So here's um, stuff about your first uh, Hello World deployment for Cassandra. So how do you do installation? Um, you, you grab your stuff off the cassandra.apache.org site. Uh, so I wanted to talk about the different releases as well um, in, in this section because, again, there's a lot of confusion. So the latest uh, release is 3.11.8. So that's what the, that's the stuff that you would deploy to production if you're new to Cassandra. Um, there's a 
beta release right now for Cassandra 4.0. So that's the newest um, upcoming version um, that uh, the community has. Um, you wouldn't really install um, beta 2 for um, your production yet because it's not GA. Um, so you'd really look at um, 3.11.8. Um, there's installation documents that uh, worked on to update at the uh, Apache site. Um, so that's pretty much if you follow those steps that I've put in that document, step by step, uh, you're pretty much guaranteed to get Cassandra up and running. Um, and so you can do tarball installations, uh, you can do RPM or uh, you can do, there's a dev package as well for Cassandra. Um, but if you're new, I would, I would suggest that doing the tarball installation because there's, there's less things that can go wrong. It's, it's, uh, it makes it very simple for you too. So what about um, after you've installed Cassandra, what happens next? Um, it's fairly easy. There's only one file to configure. That's the Cassandra.yaml file. Um, and in, so in this slide, I wanted to talk about, so there's three things really that you need to, um, for a, a Cassandra cluster to form. Um, all the nodes need to have the same uh, cluster name. They need to have um, the same seeds list. So seeds list are just the IP addresses for uh, the nodes that you'll have in a cluster. Um, if, if you don't configure any of this, you'll be able to start a single node um, just just one node, but the unfortunate thing is it won't be able to you, you won't be able to start any other node. So you're not really operating a cluster. It will just be a, a single node deployment. Um, so the two things that you need to do is configure the listen address and the RPC address in the Cassandra.yaml. Um, and so typically what you'll have is that in the listen address, you'll have the private IP address because this is how the nodes communicate with each other. This is how they'll be able to gossip um, if, if you've worked with uh, clusters before. So this is the internode communication. So this is a private network that the nodes uh, communicate with on each other. That's what you would configure in the listen address. The RPC address is the IP address that is typically a public IP if you've got a multi-home uh, server, so you've got multiple NICs, and the RPC address is what the client or your application will connect to, which is why that's typically a public IP. Now, if you're just testing it out, say, on, um, on your laptop or um, on a server that, uh, um, also in a, on a private network, then you would typically have the RPC address and the listen address both sharing the same IP. Um, the problem is when you don't configure the RP address correctly, you won't be able to access the node from outside the cluster. So that's something that's um, quite important to, to note as well. Um, I've made a uh, highlight there that um, in 4.0, you'd need to include the CQL port when you specify the seeds list. So it will look like an IP and then colon 9042 for every single uh, node that you configure. So that's coming up in 4.0, not in 3.11.8 or 3.0 yet. Uh, oh, sorry, it won't get, um, that's not how you do it in, in the, the current releases, but it changes in 4.0. So just be aware of that. Um, and, and on that note, it's, um, if you're learning as well, it's very good to, if you can help us out and test out uh, 4.0, um, play around with it, and then report any problems um, that you run into, just so um, we can get a 4.0 release uh, GA pretty soon. Now. We're going to move on to the section about um, planning your deployment. Uh, so, common question: uh, How, what kind of hardware do we deploy Cassandra on? So, specifically talking about production, um, I like uh, eight core machines with 32 gigabytes of RAM. That's that's kind of really your minimum when when it comes to production. Um, but a lot of organizations I've worked with deploy nodes with 16 cores and 64 gigs of RAM. 
Um, but if you're just trying it out, you know, you can run uh, Cassandra on a single core machine with um, only, you know, even just eight gigs. Um, you know, if, if you if you really stretch, you can run Cassandra with um, just uh, four gigs of RAM. Obviously, there's not a lot that you can do with it. You can't do like a lot of stress testing. It will only really, it's you know, a single core four gig machine is really just something that you do where you're doing like functional testing and, you know, maybe one or two transactions per second type stuff, um, which means that, you know, if you've got a, uh, a MacBook with a 16 core with 16 cores on it, you should be fine running like a, a three node cluster. Um, but obviously, there's not a lot that you can do with it, but you can play around with it. Um, I highly recommend using SSDs. Can't stress that enough. Um, you know, a lot of people. Um, I was fielding a question uh, just earlier today. Someone wanted to, to you know, tips on how to churn. Um, they cluster uh, to because they run into problems when uh, their their traffic um, goes up a little bit, but it turns out they're using um, spinning disks, and there's really not much you can you can do um, when it comes to that. So uh, I highly recommend SSDs um, and a one terabyte, maybe a two terabyte uh, machine um, is the sweet spot, um, and I'll get to to why. Um, I recommend uh, one terabyte SSD, so one terabyte uh, disks um, in, in a couple of slides later. Um, because it's mostly about how much data you have on the node. Um, in, in my experience, the gen my general recommendation is to have, um, you know, you try get the node density of about 500 gigs per node. Um, and as you get closer to that um, one terabyte mic, Mark, in terms of the amount of data that you have on a node, I, I would highly recommend that you start planning uh, adding more nodes to your cluster, because um, you need to know that there's a there's a massive trade-off when it comes to dense nodes. Yes, you can run nodes with three terabytes, five terabytes, maybe even more, but it makes it really difficult when it comes to uh, things like you know, uh, when you're running repairs, uh, repairs take a lot longer when you're trying to repair, you know, a one terabyte node compared to when you're just repairing 500 gigabytes of um, data. Things like bootstrapping as well, when you want to add nodes to your cluster, again, you know, the, the dense nodes, um, you run into more problems when you have a, you know, like when you're bootstrapping a one and a half terabyte node compared to bootstrapping 500 gigs of data. Um, similarly, when you're decommissioning nodes, um, that becomes a problem as well, because you've got more stuff that you've got to uh, um, stream out of the servers. So understand that um, when you're choosing, um, you know how you how you deploy your clusters. Here's another question that um, comes up quite a fair bit. So. Uh, with your JVM configuration. If you're in production, um, you know, you really should have um, allocate 16 gigs to the heap. The default uh, uh, GC for um, Cassandra is CMS. Um, and you really want to use um, CMS when, you know, you've got that smaller heap size, which is like 16 to 24 um, gigabytes. Generally, um, once you get to you know 20 gigabytes, I, I, uh, I highly recommend uh, switching to G1 GC um, for up to uh, 31 gigabytes. Um, but that means that um, once you're using uh, G1 GC, you really need to go up from that original recommendation of you know having a machine that's only got 32 gigs of RAM. You really need to be pushing up towards you know 40 to 48. Uh, gigabyte um, memory, at least on the server, if you're going to allocate 31 gigs of um, memory to uh, G1 GC. So those are the two things. So on smaller heaps, uh, CMS performs better, and sm small is a relative term. So, um, you know, it, for the purposes of talking about Cassandra, it's like 16 to 20 gigs, um, even up to 24 gigs. Uh, 
you know, if you're used to using CMS, lots of um, people who have been using CMS for a long time, they'd stick with CMS up until 24 gigs. Um, although in my personal experience, you're probably better off once, once you're going beyond that uh, 20 gig heap, you're really better off um, switching to G1 GC, just because G1 performs a lot better for larger heap sizes. So that's just something uh, you'd like to keep in mind. Um, I've made a note there about, uh, you know, just sticking to a maximum of 31 gigs. Um, that's because a 32 gig heap is, um, it actually has less addressable uh, memory or less addressable objects than a 31 gig heap. And I've put a, um, a blog post from Fabian um, that talks about um, that on 64 bit systems. So um, for those who are interested. So just to reiterate, a 32 gig heap um, has less addressable objects than 31. So only go up to a maximum, of, excuse me, a maximum of um, 31 gigs. Um, really important to know. If you're deploying on public clouds, I've already mentioned that um, I'm a fan of, you know, like a eight gig, uh, 32. Uh, sorry, eight core 32 gig systems. Um, if you're running on AWS, uh, I really like the i32x large as a starting off point. Um, lots of organizations would scale up to like an i34x large. Um, um, I really like the i3s because of the NVMe um, SSDs that they come with. So, you know, if, if latency really matters to your use case, um, you've really got to go with the i3s. Although, um, you know, I understand that some like, some don't like the idea of running your production systems on ephemer ephemeral uh, storage. So M5Ds are, are a good choice for that, um, as opposed to a traditional M5. So mainly the difference there in, in um, a lot of, you know, a lot of the, people um, on the session right now have um, a lot of experience. But so I'm, I'm mostly talking about this for the uh, for those who are new to Cassandra and new to cloud, for example. Um, the main difference between an M5 and an M5D instance is that the M5Ds have an onboard uh, SSD. They, they're quite good to use for uh, commit logs um, because then it makes your writes um, really fast. Um, so that's that's my recommendation. If you're going to go with GP2, um, you can, uh, you, but you have to provision three and a half terabytes um, of uh, EBS to to get uh, the 10k IOPS because you only get uh, three IOPS per per gigabyte. And really, for uh, production workloads on Cassandra, you really need that um, 10k IOPS um, throughput. Um, but so, um, so that gets really expensive, uh, provisioning three and a half terabytes when you're really going to use less than one terabyte. Um, but that's, that's what it is for GP2. On IO1, you can, you don't have to provision, uh, three and a half terabytes because you can, you can just, um, provision the IOPS. So you can get, um, 10K IOPS. And, and that's, for me, that's what I generally, uh, recommend. On Azure, it's a little bit slightly different. So um, the instance that I like is a standard uh, D8S, uh, which is in D3 right now. Um, Azure keeps coming up with uh, newer instance types. So that's the current model. It used to be um, a, uh, I think it was a DSV3 or something, what it was called, um, the equivalent, uh, uh, instance type. Um, on Azure, you would provision uh, premium storage. Uh, P30 is a sweet spot. So um, you get that one terabyte. Um, the, the, the good thing about uh, those instances is that um, they have an onboard cache. So I think uh, it's, it has a 256 uh, gig cache, which um, can sustain uh, 16K IOPS. Um, and and what, what does that mean? So premium storage um, on Azure is 
really the equivalent of a network attached disk, um, you know, much like um, what EBS is, except that the throughput is quite low. Um, I think it, the P30s cap out at um, 200 megabytes per second. So it really isn't a lot. Um, um, we were talking in the previous session before where some, you know, some clusters have really large partitions. So imagine if you had like a one gig partition that you're, you're deserializing. Um, having to, to, to send that across the wire with only 200 megabytes per second means that it'll take you five seconds to read that partition of a, um, a P30 disk because you're, 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 you know, transferring that stuff across the wire. Um, the good thing with the with the the D8S uh, instances is that they have with the onboard cache. Um, I think uh, for the D8S it starts with a I think it was 400 uh, gigabytes of um, onboard cache, which is um, a SSD that's embedded in the in the instance itself, which means that um, if you if you if you have about say 500 gigs of data per node, it means that you're caching most of your data on the onboard SSD. So you're not, you're not constantly having to drag it across the wire um, on, from your P30 disk. So you, instead of reading from the P30 across uh, the, the, the network, you're, reading, you're really reading your data off the um, onboard SSDs after it gets cached. Obviously, there's a bit of warm-up time that's um, involved in that. Um, so I've made a note that you need to enable the read-only cache and you have to disable barriers. Um, they, I've put a, uh, a link there where you can um, see how you enable the, uh, the cache on those um, instances. Now, some recommended settings. Um, for virtual nodes, uh, we've, we've been talking quite about this quite a bit on the mailing list. And um, so the current default is 256. That's a really bad uh, default. We, we know a lot more now than what we used to um, a few years ago. Um, Joey Lynch um, and, ooh, uh, the other author escapes me at the moment, but um, wrote a paper about, uh, you know, num tokens. Um, so generally for me, I'm used to recommending eight. Um, 16 is also a good choice um, in terms of the num tokens. Um, it does mean that there's a bit of um, data skew, so your, uh, your nodes won't exactly have, um, you know, uh, balanced data. So there might be like a 10 or 15% differential. So say you might have like a node that's 500 gig, but then you'll have another node that might be like 550, 560 gigabytes. Um, if data skew is a really big concern uh, for you, for you um, then you can go to 32 num tokens, maybe 64 at the most, although um, that's, uh, 64 is probably pushing it. So um, obviously your miles will, may vary because your data might not be um, completely uh, random in terms of the distribution. And, you know, you might have partitions that, you know, you might have partitions that are only one megabyte in size, and then you have partitions that are, I don't know, 500 megabytes in size. So that would obviously affect your data distribution and the the density on the nodes. Um, but just going back, um, you know, uh, eight or 16 is a good choice when um, um, setting your num tokens uh, in Cassandra.yaml. Um, so there's a, a ticket at the moment where, uh, from Jeremy Hanna, where um, we've made the recommendation to, to switch the defaults down to 16. Um, instead of 256, just uh, to make it easy for new users. Um, really quickly, so I'll quickly run through the next slides. Um, so for replication, um, again, for new users, we recommend that um, you have a three replicas per DC. So if you have a two DC setup, 
um, you know, the first DC will have three replicas and the second DC will have three replicas as well. Um, even if you're using uh, single DC clusters, get used to always using network topology strategy. This makes your uh, your configuration future proof so that when when it comes to a time when you want to um, scale up your cluster and add another DC, it makes the transition really simple if you if you've started off using a network topology strategy. So as soon as you create new application key spaces, um, just use network topology strategy, even if you have no intention of adding um, any any DC, you know, more than one DC to your cluster. Um, it just gets you off to a good start. Um, for racks, this, this one comes up quite a lot. I feel a lot of questions about racks. Um, I'm a big fan of single rack configuration. Uh, it, it makes it, it, for me personally, I think it suits most um, environments. Um, but if you really want to take advantage of um, the Cassandra racks, and, and there are advantages to doing that. So for example, if you have um, your, if you have a, a DC where the nodes are distributed across three racks, you can you can say do like a, a rolling restart of all the nodes in that are on the same rack, or you know say you can do um, patching of those racks because then you're guaranteed that there are two other racks that will take the load. Um, and so, in in a couple of slides before, the general recommendation is that you have um, three replicas for DC. So if you're going to use racks, I I recommend that you have uh, three racks um, in each DC as well. If that's not something that uh, you can do, then fall back into a single single rack configuration. Uh, the main reason for that is that the, the data distribution, so I see a lot of um, folks where they have a replication factor of three and they only have, they have like a two rack configuration. Um, and, and what happens is that the, the data is not balanced, um, not, not, you know, the data distribution on, on the node is not balanced because it's hard to, to divide, you know, um, three replicas on, across just two racks. Or, um, you know, I've, I've seen uh, some situations where, again, still with a replication factor of three, but they have five racks um, in the DC. Again, you know, the, the data distribution is not balanced. And, and I don't know that you get a lot of, a lot of benefit from doing that by, not have, by having that weird kind of uh, configuration. So um, when in doubt, um, just go with a single rack configuration. For snitch, um, there's a lot of snitches out there. Um, I, I, I get that there's, a, there's an appetite to use like um, specific cloud snitches. So for example, if you're on EC2, to use the EC2 snitch because then you know you don't have to configure the racks. Um, that's all handled for you, but um, highly recommend using uh, GPFS. Um, it's, it's very flexible and you know, at this, you know, at this point you might think, oh, we're only ever gonna be say on um, EC2, so you know we're have to stick with EC2 snitch. Um, but you know when when it comes a time when you, you want to, for example, uh, go hybrid, so you might have like an on-premise DC and uh, and you know a DC on AWS, or you want to um, expand your cluster to Azure, um, you really need to use GPFS and in you know, it becomes a real pain having to switch from, say, an uh, uh, you know, an EC2 snitch or a Google Cloud snitch um, in the future. So, use up, just use GPFS as a default. Um, really quickly, um, again, this comes up a lot too. Uh, use a strong consistency um, uh, and Highly recommend local quorum for both reads and writes. Um, there's, there's, there's quite a lot of come up across um, organizations that use a consistency level of two. Um, 
that's uh, really problematic because when you when you um, add another DC, suddenly your uh, your uh, consistency is no longer local. So you, you know there's a chance that you could be um, you know doing uh, you're expecting a, a, a local consistency, but you're, you're hitting remote nodes. Um, so it's um, so that's um, quite important to to note too. So um, don't allow remote DCs for uh, local consistencies. Um, some more recommended settings from um, an operating system perspective. This list is not exhaustive. Um, I've picked the, the ones that are, you know, um, easy to knock off. Um, TCP keep alive, particularly, this is really important. Um, if, if you've got firewalls um, between nodes, between DCs, um, which you should have, um, because the TCP keep alive will just uh, make sure that you know your connections and your sockets uh, don't uh, don't get um, disconnected. Um, CPU frequency scaling as well. Disable that um, straight away if, if you know, particularly for um, Red Hat systems where um, you know it's enabled by default. Um, that will kill the performance of your cluster. Um, Particularly when you hit like low traffic periods, because uh, your your service trying to save um, power and yeah, so the latency goes up when when you try to do reads, for example. Um, yeah, I knew that this was going to be contentious about disabling swap. There's there's a lot of uh, you know organizations who are uh, you know they they love their swap. Um, uh, I don't understand it. I don't get it. Um, if 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 you have to enable swap, then you know set swappiness to um, one or something. Um, it, it really doesn't um, do well when your JVM is getting uh, swapped out. Um, you know you get all sorts of weird errors. So this is one of the first things I check when someone um, asks me. You know and have a problem with uh, performance or you know like. Uh, strange behavior from their cluster. Um, another good one to to do is to to drop the read ahead to eight kilobytes. Um, that's just so you're not uh, pulling a lot of data off the disk. And particularly in those um, cases where uh, you know your cluster has really small partitions, um, you can even drop that read ahead further down to um, 4Ks. Um, again, so you know it increases the throughput um, of your cluster because you you can you can um, you know do more reads of the disk, but you're only reading small chunks um, out. Um, and one final thing about um, operating system uh, uh, tuning is that um, disable the transparent huge pages uh, defrag. Um, I've put up a, a link there for where you can get a little bit more uh, detail about these uh, recommended settings. So we've we've gone through the the first and second sections just uh, for a bit of a reminder. I'm going to quickly go on to the tools now just to try and stick to time. So I get asked about this a lot. So for backups, there's Cassandra Medusa. By the way, these are all open source tools. They're all Free um, for repairs, there's Cassandra Reaper. Um, makes it really easy to manage your repairs. Um, you really got to have monitoring, right? So um, when when um, fielding questions from different users and stuff, usually the first thing I ask is, you know, um, I'm asking about some of the metrics, like you know, what your what does your monitoring look like? Um, there's a uh, data stacks metrics collector for Apache Cassandra, which allows you to ex um, uh, export the metrics to Grafana and Prometheus. Um, really easy to to get it working out of the box if you're already using uh, Prometheus in your environment. Um, for benchmarking, there's no SQL bench. Um, there's uh, TLP stress from uh, the last pickle. Um, so these things um, replace uh, Cassandra stress. And 
more recently, um, Harry got uh, accepted uh, into the project. So that's one new thing to look at. Uh, I haven't seen it myself. Um, and if you're doing, doing data migration, so um, it, I highly recommend the DS uh, bulk loader. You can do, um, you can load uh, and unload uh, data into CSV or JSON format. Um, it's also a good way of uh, doing count. Um, and Uh, troubleshooting. So I'm just going to quickly power through because I'm I've only got four minutes left. So um, really important if you're new to Cassandra, don't just um, stop start your nodes without looking at the logs. Always keep watching the logs. Um, one really important thing to point out is that you need to familiarize yourself with what a working node looks like. Um, you know because. Sometimes when, when you hit a problem, you know, you don't know whether something is okay or not um, when you're looking at the log entries because, you know, if you don't know what a normal, uh, uh, a working node looks like. So that's something that's um, really important to keep in mind. Um, just a bit of a plug. So when you're asking questions, whether it's on Slack or the mailing list or whatever, um, you know, help me help you provide the versions of C, because that's really important. The, you know, um, the, the type of driver that you're using in the version, um, the, the Java version that you're using, plus the vendor as well, that, um, you know, in some cases that's handy. Um, that when you're asking the question, tell us what investigation you've already done and what, what things did you already rule out. Um, and it's really important that, you know, instead of just providing a random, uh, Except exception, um, you know, you should you should really provide the full error message with the full stack trace, because um, that stack trace is. Um, I'll, I'll talk about the stack trace in a second, um, but just quickly, um, some of the commands it's really helpful when you're uh, troubleshooting issues. So look at node tool net stack. So the repair sessions, um, types of read repairs. Uh, TP stats tells you about things like drop messages, whether you're dropping mutations or you're dropping reads. Also really handy to find out whether you've accidentally enabled uh, tracing and because that's that will affect your the performance of your cluster um, heavily. Um, there's other commands there um, too, so proxy histograms and table histograms, so if, um, just to get an idea of the kind of latencies that you're hitting with your cluster, um, and table stats as well. Um, uh, I mentioned about the stack trace. If you can read a bit of Java, you know, um, you don't need to be a, an expert, just um, do a bit of code diving. Um, use the stack trace as a starting point, but make sure that you're looking at the right Cassandra version when you're code diving. Um, um, and just really quickly, um, there's free online resources. So there's datastacks.com dev. Um, there's, you know, like uh, tutorials there, you know, 10, 15 minute tutorials uh, where you can quickly learn some key concepts about Cassandra. Um, there's free courses at academy.datastacks.com. Um, uh, and if you're if you're new to building apps, there's datastacks.com examples. So we give out um, code examples there to get you started really quickly, just so you don't have to start from scratch. Um, and finally, if you if you've got any questions, there's AFC, ASF Slack, there's um, the Cassandra mailing list. Um, I do answer stuff on Stack Overflow too when, when I have a bit of spare time. And finally, there's um, community.datastacks.com. Thank you. I think I just managed to get in. Thanks a lot. I'm happy to answer questions on um, the ApacheCon Slack if, uh, if you've got any questions.